you want through the Bible, what does that really mean? But what, what I'm going to talk about tonight is, I guess you could say almost the polar opposite in that, which is about true spiritual joy. Because I think, when we look at it, if, if we're a Christian, Christian, that's what every one of us should actually be wanting to achieve is what I would call true <coughs> spiritual joy. It's because, because our joy in Christ should be the most important thing that we have, our salvation in Christ. I'm going to read it from a scripture tonight. It might be a little bit different than what you heard before. I know it's probably a familiar scripture. It comes from John chapter 13, which is a scripture that, I don't know if it's a real familiar, but... Um, if you are familiar with John chapter 13, it's going to talk about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And what does that have to do with us today? Our church doesn't really observe washing the feet. I'm not saying we wouldn't do it. We have done it before. But as far as on a regular basis, we don't wash feet. Now, some churches believe that based off this scripture, we're supposed to be washing people's feet all the time. I'm not saying we should or we shouldn't. And that's not what I'm going to talk about tonight because I believe the scripture does give, give us the literal washing of the feet, but there's a bigger message because Christ even tells them that you don't understand why I'm doing this yet. And, and if it was just simply for humility, they would have understood that automatically because of their culture. Their culture was even different than ours, but if today if I was to offer to wash your feet, there's a certain amount of humility that you know would happen with that. I know what little I've experienced with it, it gives you a certain amount of humility, with, with somebody washing their feet. feet. But see, today, we, we, we don't, don't really do it. But, but if, if you were a Jew, Jew even the, the Jews that were at the lowest of low didn't wash people's feet. feet. The, the servants that were Jews didn't, didn't wash feet. feet. It, it would have been somebody else. else. It, it would have been somebody like a Gentile that would have washed your feet because why? They were lower than low. And, and that, that was the lowest job that you could have was washing somebody's feet. He's like, well, our feet's pretty bad today, but imagine how their feet were walking around in sand and sandals all the time and sweating all the time, and everywhere you went was a dust bowl. Your feet would have been more than that. just talk to you about But Jesus has done something. And he washed their feet, as we know what this story is about. I've got several scriptures we're going to read, so it's kind of lengthy. So just hang in there with me, because I want us to get through this whole thing. And then we're going to come back and we'll talk about it. And I'm going to break it down, because if you go with the words that he used, not the words in our English Bible, but the words that he actually used, there's a greater meaning than just wash or clean. The words actually have a bigger and deeper meaning than what... We, we have in our Bible. We have to dig a little bit deeper to find that. So, so we're going to start in verse 1, just so we have the whole story here. So it says, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put in the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took the towel and girded himself. Have you ever thought about how many people was in that upper room in that supper that night? Well, that was 12 in Jesus. I believe that was 14. Because it says that Satan was with Jesus. I'm not saying in a physical form, but Satan was in that room. Because he even called Jesus Satan. If you think about it. I got to thinking about that little, little upper room. And if there was anybody on earth at that time, other than there were some ladies that I think were really, really close to God. I'm not saying for Jesus. But this was the upper crust. I mean, these were the ones that were closest to him and understood him. And we have a lot of others, but this is the ones that he actually called to be his apostles. What 
kind of influence do you think it was by having Judas in the room? Just the mere presence of Judas, even though they didn't understand it, but the mere presence of Judas in the room, it's kind of like when we come to church and the mere presence of Satan being in here. How does that change our service? Well, I don't know what Satan here. Well, well what does it say? It says you're either for him or you're against him. And if you came here and you're not a believer, meaning that you're not a child of his, then you came here and represent Satan to That's why the church is in such a mess, because we have as many lost people in the church as we do saved people. And that influence has changed the whole dynamics of how church is supposed to be. Because, because we see how church is supposed to be in. It was like in the early church, the day of Pentecost, where everybody says everyone was in one accord. I would assure you, and I don't know everybody's mind that's here this morning, but I would say not everybody was in one accord this morning. That would be hard for us to, to really, for me to understand, because I, I don't believe that everybody was in one accord this morning. I'm not saying they were against everybody and trying to push, but they weren't along with you. So remember, they're in the supper room. Jesus is there. But Jesus was there too. Verse 4 says, And he rises from the supper and lays aside his garment and took the towel and girded himself. That's not saying that Jesus took all his clothes off. Man, he took out his outer garment that he had on and he put around, you know, it says a towel, but it's actually a linen cloth. It would have been some type of linen cloth that he used that he girded by himself. Most likely he put it in his, what we would call like a belt today, but it wouldn't have been a belt. But something he just put it about to have it so whenever he could wash the feet. It says in verse 5, And after he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel or with the linen cloth, wherewith he was girded, then cometh, to he, then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? It had to be Peter, didn't it? Peter's always the one that's got to say something. But Peter was the one that said, Are you going to wash my feet too? That's the way I would say it. Are you going to wash mine? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. So I want you to think about that. What he's saying is, is you don't understand what I'm doing right now, but you will. Later. Now, I didn't mean in five minutes. He said, You will understand later. And Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Now, that would almost seem a little bit harsh. All Jesus is doing is washing a bunch of people's feet. And Peter didn't want to be a part of that because he didn't want Jesus to sink down and wash his as a servant. That's the way that I would interpret it. But Jesus said, if I don't do it, and he didn't specifically say his feet, but he said, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. So just kind of remember those couple of things. We're going to come back to those. And Peter saith, excuse me, uh, verse 9. And Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So Peter went from 100 degrees, 180 degrees, and said, well, if you're going to do it, I want it all. You know what? If you if, if you gotta wash if you gotta wash my feet, just wash everything. I want to get all you got to give. That's how I would put it. Peter's still missing the point. But Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but he is clean every bit, and ye are clean, but not all. We're gonna come back, that's gonna be a key scripture. Verse eleven says, For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. And he's speaking to the group here. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garment and was set it down again, he saith unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also to wash another's feet. For one another's feet. 
For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your scripture. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord, that leads and guides us, leads and guides us Lord, and lives inside of us. Lord, be about us tonight, Lord. Just manifest yourself to us and to these people, Lord, that we will say the things you have to say that we can understand what you've got for us tonight. So God, just be with us. Be with the whole service. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'll just look at the spiritual joy that I, I, I think that he's trying to really show us. And there's some key factors here. As I was doing a little research, I found this little story that the guy had about Benjamin Franklin. I'm not a huge fan, I guess you'd say, of Benjamin Franklin. I'm not a real negative person about him, but I'm not saying he's the most religious person that there's ever been. But um, when you talk about him in church, but he said something that made a lot of sense and even would apply today to us. He said, it is said that as Benjamin Franklin concluded a stern speech on the guarantees of the Constitution, a heckler shouted, oh, them words don't mean nothing at all. What's all the happiness you say is guaranteed to us? Franklin smiled and replied, my friend, the Constitution only guarantees the American people the right to pursue happiness. You have to catch it yourself. See, we get so mixed up sometimes that we expect somebody else to give us and to make us happy whenever that's not what we're supposed to do. For us to have true happiness, true joy, it's got to come from within also. It's like the gift of God. It's out there free for everybody. But just because He said He died for the whole world doesn't mean that everybody in the whole world is going to get it. You've got to go out and you've got to receive it. The same as the Americans, whenever we look at the pursuit of happiness, it should be there for everybody. But you've got to do it. We're not going to guarantee it. And today, I think in America, we're trying to guarantee happiness to everybody when you can't do it. You can't guarantee happiness to everybody. I got to thinking about how the church is. Does not the church try to do the same thing sometimes? We try to fit every little nook and cranny or try to fit everybody's need to make everybody happy when we don't produce happiness anyway. It's kind of like money can bring you happiness. Well, it can. I ain't going to lie to you. I mean, money will bring you happiness, you know, for a short amount of time. It's kind of like whenever you get a brand new truck, whether it's brand new or whether it's a new to you, that's only really short lived until another one comes out that's a little bit better than yours. Or you come to church and somebody else has got one that looks a little nicer than yours. And he, why didn't I think he had that on You see what I'm saying? It's always there's something where we're trying to get more and more and more. Things will never bring you happiness for long periods of time. Like sin. Sin can make you happy for a short period of time. But then sin's going to take you down the path. For you'll never be happy again. We're Christ. He will give you true happiness. And hopefully we'll see that here in Scripture here and then. So when you think about happiness and true spiritual joy, that's what we should be seeking. And the only place we're going to get is from Him. So when I look at spiritual joy or the result of how do we achieve that and what, what are we going to get? I think we see a little bit of that in verse 3 through 5. And that's living a servant's life. Christ came to this earth to be like one of us. He took on flesh and became one of us. And He didn't just become one of us. He also became a servant to all of us. He went to the cross for us. He does something nobody else could do for us. In verse 3 it says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands, Jesus knew 
and everything had been given to him. And that he was come from God, and he went to God, meaning he was getting ready to return to God. Jesus understood the whole, what was getting ready to take place. We've been studying in our Sunday school up until this point. We've not got quite here yet. But pretty much all of Jesus' life all the way up through, and we just about have got to the crucifixion. It's been really close. Everything Jesus did from birth until he died on the cross was a plan. It was for us to be able to have the thing called salvation. That we, we could be able to return or, or be able to go to heaven, to heaven and live with our Father. And Jesus is that avenue. So, so first, it says that Jesus, Jesus knew that his Father had given all things in his hands and that he had come from God and went to God or going to God, basically, is a better interpretation. He rises from supper and lay aside his garments and took a towel and linen cloth and girded himself. And then that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wash there with a towel. Therewith he was good. Jesus went from being number one in the room. I mean, you have to imagine this. Jesus, everywhere he went, if you think about it, he was pretty much the focal point. He may, he may not have been number one in everybody's eyes, eyes but, but he was the focal point. Even, even whenever, whenever we go back and we see how the scribes and the Pharisees and all, and all those people treated him and how they always was, was the focus still not on Jesus. They were, they were always trying, trying to push the focus on Jesus, Jesus even though they were trying to do it in a negative, negative way. Jesus was the focal point. And in, and in this room, room as, as they were eating, Jesus was still the focal point. And he was number one. We won't look at it that way. But he, but he became the lowest person in the whole room when he poured that water in that basin and took on that towel. I'm starting to wash it And I got to thinking about did Jesus do that for us today? I wonder if, maybe not in a literal sense, you know, literally he was in the upper room and then and had a towel girded about him and had a basin of water and was washing it. But in, but in a, a spiritual, spiritual aspect, aspect, is that not what Jesus has done for us? He says he's, he's washing us, and we'll find that over here in just a minute. Not, not literally our feet, but Jesus has to wash us. us. He, he has taken, washed, washed us completely, 100%, not just our feet. But, but he became that servant in order to be able to do that. To, to wash us, he had to become a servant to do that. So, so first, first when we look at those things, things as Jesus or living a certain life. life. You, know, you know, as, as I, I was reading, reading and I was studying a little bit, some, some people say that what he was, he was talking about here is Peter and the disciples didn't truly understand this lesson of humility. And I don't believe it. I, I think that Peter and the disciples were fairly intelligent men, and they, and they understood that what Jesus was doing was some, Some type of form of humility. I think, I think that was just an automatic. automatic. I don't I think, think you had to guess what that was. They, they may have been guessing what the real story was because they knew from, from times past, past, every time Jesus done something, what, what they, they thought, thought it was was usually something, something different. He was teaching them multiple things, things and every time he was teaching. And they, and they understood the humility part, I think. It doesn't say that. But when he asked him, about, about washing his feet, he said, in, in verse 7, seven he says, What, what I do, thou knowest not, now that thou shalt know hereafter. I think, I think he was, was telling him a little bit about something else. And, and we'll, we'll get under that in a minute. But the foot washing was the slave's, slave's work, as I've talked about. Most, most likely it was a Gentile, Gentile slave, but then, then a Jewish, Jewish slave. But he but also showed that the master... Became the when you when went to somebody's house back in those days, they usually somebody, a servant or somebody washed your feet. But it wasn't the person that owned the house at night. It wouldn't have been the head person at the house. If you came to my house, I would have somebody else that washed your feet. It wouldn't be me. But Jesus became the, he was the master, and he became the one that was the servant and then the lowest of jobs. He used, he used a lesson to reduce the selfishness of the disciples too. If you think about over in Luke chapter 22 and 24, where they're, they're debating, debating back and forth, who's going to be the greatest when we get there? 
kind of but that's, that's easier for us to look at it and think, well, those people's crazy. Why, why did that even come up? It wouldn't make no difference who's the greatest. Well, why do we think it's the same thing sometimes? We want to know where our place is. And we don't want to be in last. We want to be in the first place. And the disciples was no different. They were walking around with Jesus and they wanted to know if they were the best one. And I think it's just another way, way if you remember what Jesus told them, he said the least will be the greatest and the greatest will be the least. I think it's just another show of him being the greatest and they knew that. And he became the least. It was just another lesson he was given and the rebuking of that selfishness that the disciples had had. But also, he was given an example of a few other things too about helping another because his burdens. We go, we go to Galatians, Galatians and y'all have to turn there. Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. Or excuse me, Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, six I'm sorry. Verse 2. Galatians, 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 Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Bear you one another's burdens, and, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, so how, how, do you, how, how, do you, how do you get joy? You've got to do what Christ has done. Fulfill the law of Christ. And what, what is it he tells us in Galatians chapter 2? Bear you one another's burdens. You know, we talked talk about that just a few minutes. Or Ken did right before. We all had prayer and decay. And somewhat, you could say, we were trying to bear that burden with her. But I'll give you an example. Just use that since I'm not sure it would matter. Mine. What, what, what we did, I'm not saying it wasn't a part of bearing the burden. But how has your life changed since you found out the potential for her? Has anything changed? Has your life continued on exactly like it was other than just it might come into your mind once in a while? Would you say that that's bearing one another's burdens? If it just comes in your mind once in a while? Or if we send it out on the phone tree or somebody just happens to call and they mention your case name and we just happen to remember, is that bearing the burden or has it become a part to where it is a concern that's on your mind all the time? See, now, when we start thinking about what Christ is telling us to do to bear other people's burdens, and I think that we're supposed to bear each other's burdens as far as brothers and sisters in Christ, that's just what we're supposed to do. And again, again, I'm not, not trying, trying to point anybody out. I don't know anybody's thoughts. I'm just, just telling you how my mind works most of the time. When, when I, I say that I'm willing to take on a burden of somebody else, that means a whole lot more than I was praying for you once. Because I know from past experiences, things that's happened in my own life with me and Ed. That because she didn't have a choice, when she, she took on the burden that I had, and we had together, it changed her whole thought process, it changed my whole thought process. So, so when the scripture, scripture says, Bear you one another's burdens, and, and so fulfill the law of Christ, it's a little, little different than just I'll pray, pray for you once in a while. He can just like this next one. In Ephesians chapter 4, if you were right there, you won't have to go over far, just a couple of pages. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says something a little bit different. It talks about forgiveness and another, another his trespasses. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God forgave you. As God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let me read that again. And be ye kind one to another, in the heart, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. I'm going to put that in my just plain old words. We're supposed to treat each other with a tender heart. We're supposed to forgive each other whenever people do things to us that they shouldn't do. As, As we, we all make mistakes. mistakes. 
People say things and do things they should not do. But are we supposed to hold that against them? Based on Scripture, it says no. Because why? Because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Has forgiven you. So when we look at this lesson that He's given them, it's a greater lesson than just washing their feet. He's, he's talking, talking about, in my opinion, he's talking, he's talking about taking on the burdens of each other. He's talking about forgiving each other of our trespasses. Because I will assure you that if we're here for any length of time, over a long period of time, I am probably going to say something that you may not agree with. And I'm not talking about in the pulpit. I'm talking about it might be in a, a meeting. It might be when we're just outside talking. It might be something that you may overhear me and misunderstand. I'm probably going to say something that you may not like. I may have some kind of an action that you don't particularly agree with. He says we're supposed to forgive each other for those things and we're supposed to move forward and move on. Because I found out a long time ago that when you hold a grudge against somebody, it don't hurt the person you're holding the grudge against. It does not affect them one bit. It's not like you're sitting at home and you're just stewing over it. That there's, there's some, some kind of magic power, power that runs over where they're at, and, and they're just having a miserable time. time. No. no. The, the person that goes, goes through, through the misery whenever you can't forgive, forgive somebody for the trespass they can get you is you. You're, you're the, the one that's living, living in the misery. You're, you're the, the one that's having to live with the torture and the torment. Why? Because you just can't let it go sometimes. And Christ is telling us, in all this, he says we need to. Help, Help each other with burdens, but also forgive them of their trespasses. But also, also he says, we should, should be reaching out to people, people outside the church also. We're supposed to be helping them. And, and we try to do that. But how, how much do we do that as individuals? And there's also, there's many ways for us to serve in all different aspects. Sometimes we want to just look at the big things. And we want to just see, well, you know, it's kind of like somebody told me the other day. He said, well, you know, there's things that... There's, there's people, people here at church, church or not necessarily here. here. They're just saying, there's people, people that I know that go to church and never do nothing. Why, Why do you really know? How do you? Because, because scripture, scripture actually says that, that the right hand not know what the left hand's doing. doing. That, that means that even within your own self, you don't, you don't supposed to be bragging about, about it to yourself. You, you never know what somebody else might be doing that nobody ever knows about. Just, Just because, because we give food, food out here and, and everybody in the community may know about it, that's, that's probably not the, the most important thing we, we do. I got, I got to thinking about it the other day. Whenever if you, if you drove by this church, church or we give you away at the fire department, you drive by the fire department, drive by the church where we're giving out food. As the people drive by, I'm sure there's a lot of people So you know what, they're doing a good thing. That's good that they're giving out food and they're doing all those things. But do you think that that's the most important one that we might give to? The most important one that we might give to might be the one that Ken just loads up in the back of the truck. That nobody in the church, other than the people doing the paperwork, even know that that food box is even the letter. Or if they loaded up five or six boxes and went out in the community and left it on people's doorsteps or went and knocked on the door that didn't even have a drive, have a vehicle to be able to come and get the food. To see if you drove by, you'd never know those people gone. Sometimes the things that are unseen and the things that people don't even not even aware of are the things that are most important is what they're trying to do for each other and for other people. So be very careful that we don't point the finger at other people and say, well, I know they don't ever do anything. We don't know what they do all the time. Just like I don't know what you do all the time, and you don't know what I do. You know what's a good thing? You don't know what I do all the time. Because you might have a different opinion. It's just the truth. Because I'm not pure all the time. I'd like to think that I was just like, you know, the, you buy that little ball of vanilla or whatever, and vanilla extracts is 100% vanilla. Wouldn't it be nice to think that you were just 100% Christian? If they would bottle you up that you were just 100% Christian and there was no flaws in it, they could say that there's no impurities in this Christian to call out. 
The best, best I can tell scripture, there's, there's nobody, nobody that's, that's ever lived on the face of earth but one that fell in that category, and that's Jesus, Jesus and what we're talking about tonight. But, but also, I think there also there was a lesson of honor that he was talking about. Like I've got the very end. So there's also a lesson of honesty. Well, let's look at a couple other things that will be shorter. But living a separated life also. We talked about first living a servant's life. Then let's look at this living a separated life. If we look in back in the scriptures in John chapter 13, I'm going to read verses 6 through 10. I want us to think about this, living in separated life. It says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, or yeah, Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash, thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. And Peter said unto him, Thou Lord shall wash my feet, never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon, and Simon Peter, Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus saith unto him, I want you, this is the scripture we're really going to want to focus on. Jesus saith unto him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but he is cleansed every bit, and ye are clean, but not all. So let's just back up. I want to catch a couple of these words because... There's, There's several, several words in there, and even in the scriptures before, that they all look the same, don't they? The first, first one was, he says, washed, and then, then we, we have, have the word clean, and we have clean, and, clean. and, and, and we, we would kind of almost take all of those and look at them the same. But, but when you look at this word, word wash, it's just Louis, 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 that, that means to wash completely from head to toe, not just the feet. So, so when we think, think about that word, that, that means just to wash the whole body. But not you, it says to wash the whole body. Then the next, when we look on, it says, it needs to say to wash his feet, but it talks about to wash the feet. It's, it's talking, talking about to wash oneself. So, so if you're washed from, from head to toe from him, him there's, there's no need for you to wash yourself. Meaning, meaning that you're not trying to cleanse yourself. You're, you're not going to cleanse yourself when, when you've been cleansed by Christ. Christ. And then, then that word clean, as we move on, it says, but it's clean every whit. Now, clean, I think all of us would agree, we... We, we like, like that word clean. I'm glad everybody, everybody took baths and cleaned, cleaned up for the camp tonight. Because if all of us did, we'd probably, probably smell it, you know? So, so it's nice for everybody to be clean. But that's, that's not what he's talking about here when he talks about cleaning every day. That word is called castrosa. Castrosa. Which means to clean and cure. It actually goes a little farther. It says physically and also to be pure, purified by fire. It's, it's also a simulated like the vine cleansed by pruning, by pruning and, and so fitted to bear fruit. It's, it's like you took and took all the dead stuff off of this vine so, so it can now bear fruit. fruit. It's, it's cleaning that. that. But, it but it goes, goes a little bit farther. It says in a Levitical sense, it means to clean, the use of which is not forbidden, imparts no uncleanness. I mean, if you, if you understand about like leaven. When we, we have, have the feast of unleavened bread. bread. I think, I think I, I preached, preached on that one time. If, if we, we had, had that today and it was a feast of the sinless, what well, we'd have in if we treated, treated it like they did with unleavened bread. They, they would go through their house, literally, and clean every nook and cranny, every shelf, every corner. We would we call it spring cleaning. cleaning. But they, they were doing it to get rid of any trace of any leaven anywhere in the home. There, there could be zero leaven anywhere. So if, so if we, we had this sin feast, or, or sinless feast, and we went through and cleaned all the sin out from corner to corner, anything that represents sin in our home, all the way through, because it might potentially keep us from going to heaven. That's what they had. Probably, Probably a big old cleaning it. You'd be filled up to preserve the house. 
But that's, that's what kind of cleaning that was talking about. A whole cleansing, meaning not to leave anything that was unforbidden or it was forbidden. And then also ethically, it means to free from a corrupt desire, from sin and guilt. That's what that word means, that kestos, that he used when he said, but it's clean every whit. That's what that means. That you're 100% clean, and how did that happen? Through Christ. That's, That's why, why I think, I don't think that Christ is dirty up his lawn and washing our feet literally today. Symbolically, is that not what he's doing to us? He cleanses us whenever we accept him. He still is a servant of business today because he is doing that for us. He says, but it's clean every bit. And you are clean. And that same word is the same one. Talking about complete clean. Then he finishes that scripture and says, but not all. And verse 11 says, for he knew who should betray him. And therefore he said, you are not all clean. He wasn't saying that Peter wasn't completely clean. He was saying that not everybody in this room is clean. Why? Because Judas was in the room with him. Judas didn't leave from after all this. Jesus even washed Judas' feet. But prior to Jesus getting down to wash his feet, it said in what verse 2, where it said Judas was already set to do the betrayal. It was already set that it was going to happen. But he washed his feet anyway. But also not just living a separate life, separated life. Because if, if we're going to be clean from Him, we've got to separate ourselves from the world and from sin and from all those things. Kind of like, almost literally like that, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, where they remove all the leaven out of the house. Really, if we want true revival, not to try to harp on that, but if we want true revival, we've got to remove all the sin out of our lives. We've got to try to remove all of those things that potentially is hindering us from being what Christ needed. What if, and don't want any answers, but just think about it in your own mind. If we look at, when I use the word church, I'm saying every born again believer in the whole entire world. Okay? And I use the word church. If the whole church, I'm not talking about anyone, I'm talking about the whole world. If their belief and their faith and their way of living, meaning everybody else, is exactly what yours is, where would the church be at? See, because we like to think that even, Even though, though we, we might have a mess once in a while, while somebody, somebody else is going to pick us slack. You know, it's like, like whenever things are not going well for me, you know, Ken's going to pick up slack. Or Ken's having a bad week, Alvin's going to kind of pick up slack. We want to look at his body of believers. But if we look at what we are, if that's what the whole church is, what kind of mess would we be in? Or what kind of a good part would we be in? It might be that we'd be really good if everybody was just like you. Or they're just like that. Or we may not. Oh, look at this. But living also is a secure life. In verse 10, he says, And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is cleansed with. If Jesus has washed you, you ain't got to worry about getting washed again. We only, we only got to get a one-time wash. Right. And, and that's, that's what he's saying. There's a security in our salvation when you receive it from Christ. Why? Because he said you don't need to do it again. He says, if he that is washed needed not saved to wash his feet, but is cleansed every whit, and you are clean. He was telling Peter, you're clean. You ain't going to need to wash your feet. And hands and your head and all those things. Well, let's back up there to where it said in verse 7. Jesus answered and said unto him, What do I thou knowest, or knowest not now, but thou shalt 
no hereafter. I don't think Peter had the full concept of he was not just washing their feet. He was telling them what he was going to wash them. He was going to wash their sins away. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about washing their sins away because washing their feet didn't do what verse 10 said. Verse 10 is really where the meaning is. Is that verse 10 he washed them completely where they don't have to worry about their feet. They don't have to worry about their hands. They don't have to worry about their hands. You've been washed completely whenever you accept Christ. And as he gets on and he says about the Master, it is the Masters who do it. And I don't think he literally, and I'm not saying he doesn't literally mean we should wash each other's feet, because I don't have any problem with it. But I think more of what he's trying to tell us is that we're supposed to be treating each other just like he treated us. Don't be like the scribes and Pharisees that we found out in the last few weeks in the Sunday school class that they're better than you are. And sometimes in church we can very easily as Christians think that we're better than someone else because we're a better Christian than they are. And when we find throughout Scripture, he even talks about, we even brought that up this morning, about the speck that's in their eye and you can't see the big old beam sticking out of yours. I'll translate that. You, you see a little bitty splinter in somebody else's eye and you want to point that out. When you've got this big old thing that's sticking out, everybody can see it. Why can't you see it yourself? We're supposed to be treating each other as Christ has treated us. And that's what He's commanding us to do. Because what do we get if we do all that? Verse 17 says, And if you know these things, and He told us that we know about them, he, he says, says, happy are ye if you do that. So, so if you want joy in life, do what Christ has told us to do. Meaning to do other, unto other people better than what you even treat yourself. Have that humility. Have that separated life. And that security. But also take on burdens and get you I know, I know whenever you take on somebody else's burdens, it's awful harder than the folks the same Most people that are going through any kind of recovery, recovery program or having struggles, they, they tell you to go out and volunteer and try to focus on other people's problems. problems. Why? Because they take your mind off yourself. They take your mind off your own. They take your mind off your own. The, the more you start worrying about other people, people, people's burdens, you'll learn to worry less about your own. The more you start worrying about other people's burdens, you'll learn to worry less about your own. But also forgiving people their trespasses. You will never have joy in your life when you can't forgive other people. You can't. And I've had those problems before. I try not to have them now. I won't say I will never have it again because there's a good possibility I will. But the only person that suffers is the person that holds the grudge or wants you got the problem forgiven because the other person has just moved on. They're living life and it makes you even matter because they're living life and good. So, somebody does me wrong, I want to make sure that they feel just as bad as I do. I mean, really, is that not how we want it? I mean, we may not say it, but honestly, that's what we're wanting. You know, if somebody stomps my toe, I want to stomp their back. Somebody pulls out in front of me, I want to make sure I cut them off. You know, you want to make them feel just like they made you feel. And at some point, we've got to get past them feeling like you feel because that's not what Christ told us to do. It's not about making them feel the same as you feel. It's about you forgiving them just like Christ forgave you. Because there are other scriptures about that too. And I don't really like talking about those, but he says, if you can't forgive them, he says, he can't forgive you either. I mean, that's saying talk, that ain't me. That's, that's scripture. I mean, that's Christ speaking. That ain't me. I don't like that. I don't like those scriptures that points his finger or steps my toe or whatever. I like it whenever he says, well, you know how you're just doing a wonderful job. And you know what? If you'll just keep on keeping on like you're doing, you're doing better than everybody else. You're going to be at the front of the road, bud. See, that's how you want to feel. But guess what? When we feel like that, we forgot about you. 
because it's not about us. We can't forgive, and we can't have, and we can't grieve for somebody else because we're focused on ourselves. That's what it's all about. We end up focusing on ourselves. And that's what Christ is trying to show them is have that humility and worry about other people and what their needs are. But also in your own, because that's what Christ did for us. It was all about our needs, it wasn't about His. There is nobody that went through more torment ever in Christ. Even though the suffering and the things that you may go through are tough, <coughs> but Christ went through a whole lot more. And He didn't have to do it. He didn't do anything wrong to get it. It's just He wanted us to have something. 